I guess somewhere along the line, I figured that since I'd gotten married later in life, that I was entitled to a long and happy marriage. And I just never would have, and I always say it was my worst nightmare to lose Stan. But when the nightmare actually happened, it was 10,000 times worse than I could have imagined. The loss of someone you care about can be one of the most difficult human experiences. Every loss is difficult, and to the person who is experiencing grief, it feels like this is the worst thing that could have happened to them. After my wife died in 1983, I certainly grieved her and missed her presence. A spouse, after all, plays a number of roles in your life. Your friend, your lover, the person you share family responsibilities and tasks with, the one who helps you with decisions, with your goals. This person is your encourager and your inspiration. But you know, when my wife died, I not only lost all these things, I lost something else as well. I lost many of the hopes and dreams and expectations of the way that life was supposed to be. We were supposed to live happily ever after, to grow old together, to see our kids grow up and marry, and then we would get our revenge and spoil the grandchildren. The loss of a spouse not only means the loss of a special person, but often the shattering of many of our expectations of life as it is meant to be. Mary Scarston experienced the loss of her spouse, and it was devastating. But whatever your experience of loss, keep watching because Mary is going to share with us how she was able to reinterpret her situation and find some sense of meaning and direction. I'm talking with Mary Scarston. Mary, welcome to Living With Loss, and tell us how you met your husband, Stan. Actually, I met my husband, Stan, when I was a teenager, and I went to a weekend where he was the speaker, and I was quite taken with him and uh, went to a, a class that he was teaching. He was married at the time, and I had no ever thought of the fact that he would be my husband. Uh, became very good friends of uh, Stan and his wife for over 15 years and was in a uh, Bible study group with them when she contracted cancer and died and so I had known him years and, and he was like they were like an older brother and sister to me in many ways. So Stan experienced the death of his first wife. How That's did right. he react to that? Uh, it's interesting now looking back uh, because in many ways the way he moved on with life and married me uh, gave me not only his permission but his blessing on me getting on with my life. And uh, So how did the two of you get together? When did the magic begin? Um, well, each one, every one of us helped him move because he uh, got a new place after his wife died and we all took our turns helping him pack up and so I went to, him, went to help him unpack and he was a gentleman, took me out for dinner first and actually I was going out with someone else at the time and he said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to start going out and so I was giving him some instructions on how to... <laughs> So, <laughs> and that night uh, he hugged me goodbye, which was 
very t we were in a Bible study group together and we'd known each other 15 years good friends you know but he didn't let go and then we said oh we got to talk about this you know because we were so shocked that this had happened and then we decided to sort of try it out for a month because we had so many people friends in common and felt that they would all have their input and advice and whatnot and after a month he said Mary Mary will you marry me and I said yes and then we had to talk about it again like what have we gotten into so <laughs> anyway so you were married, and uh, in due course, you had family together? Two children, a daughter and a son, and that's all I ever wanted out of life, Bill. I only wanted to be married and have a family. Um, along the way, I had a career teaching high school, and it's funny, because as I was coming out to do this show with you, I was thinking how the script that I would have written for my life and the script God wrote, and at times, I have really fought that and it's with time that I can look back and say well you know probably the script God wrote was better for me mm -hmm. because the career in, in high school teaching was not something I would have chosen for myself but Stan used to often say to me Mary if you would have married at age 21 you would have been sitting in my office at age 30 wanting a divorce the way <laughs> other people that he counseled he was a marriage and family therapist so it was mm -hmm. probably better for me that mm -hmm. I but I hear you saying that all you wanted out of life was to get married and have children. But so I'm for sure three years of my life, I had total happiness, Bill. Right, yeah. I had it all. Yeah, but I, I'm sure that you would also <laughs> add that one of the other things you probably wished was that you would live happily ever after and grow old together, and that didn't happen. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened when Stan contracted cancer? Well, I remember Stan was never sick. He was one of these hardy Norwegians, and um, he had a pain in his side, and we thought it was appendix went into the hospital, they also thought it was an appendix attack, found cancer right throughout his abdomen. It's one of those open, close, and I mm. remember the surgeon talking to me and I thought, this isn't happening to me, but it's happening to me, and I better really concentrate mm -hmm. on what she's mm -hmm. saying. And there was that experience of knowing very much it's happening to you, but sort of observing Sense yourself. Sense of unreality. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, indeed, in two months' time, he did die. Um, so it must so have been quite a shock. I mean, this, was, this wasn't what you bargained for. The chaos that it throws your life into is indescribable. You know, I feel that words are um, totally inadequate to express. Um, sometimes I used to think it was like a jet that's coming in for landing and the engines being thrown in reverse only mm -hmm. the jet keeps moving forward and that's that bizarre sensation of my life is in reverse and it's unraveling but it's still going forward I remember thinking with my children you know I can't come back and relive this year of their life like Halloween mm -hmm. that first Halloween believe me the last thing I wanted to do was dress up in Halloween costumes and go around trick-or-treating but I thought they won't ever be age four and age nine again and so we have to keep moving forward and they were a great blessing because children I think force life forward and uh, you have to um, they also just dealing with the death I remember at the time Stan died I wanted to make it very concrete to the children he died at 11 o'clock at night and I didn't want them to wake up in the morning and feel that they had had a bad dream so I kept his body overnight and in the morning we washed his face and said goodbye and um, at the funeral home I figured that that was our last goodbye and then I realized no Johnny's only four and he's not going to realize that that box going into the ground has his father's body in it. So I want him to, um, to know that. And that helped me, that concrete sort of facing it. Um.
We're talking with Mary Scarsden, whose husband Stan died of cancer. And Mary, the realization that Stan had died must have hit home with a, a terrible impact. What were some of your emotions and your feelings in the days around the time of the funeral and the weeks and months that followed? Well, it's interesting you say, must have hit home. People would say, oh, it must be hitting you now. And I'd say, you know, um, there's a new reality with every, it hit me when the surgeon told me. It hit me, I, I was there when he died. It was very much hit me. Mm -hmm. But as time goes on, you experience new realities. Uh, the finality, um, there's a line, the only presence is his absence. That total empty feeling, that unbearable gut-wrenching pain, uh, where you just feel like all of you hurts. Um, so what was the worst part about this? What did you miss most about Stan? Everything. We did everything together. We gardened together. We co-parented our children. We led seminars together. Um, he was my refuge and my anchor. I would run everything by him. Um, I felt, yeah, that I lost everything. So everywhere you went and everything you did, you seemed to miss him. Oh, every thought that I had would boomerang back to Stan. And I thought, I had a life before I married Stan. Why is it that it was like torment? Everything would make me think of Stan. And I remember the first day I thought, gosh, a minute went by and I didn't think of Stan. But it was just this complete blackness. Having taught theater, I saw it in terms of a stage. And um, there was no joy. I remember when my sister said, oh, about seven months later, Mary, you're, we heard you laughing again. Um, and gradually, there was a little scratch of color and then a splash. Mm -hmm. And over time, color came back into my life. Uh, what, what were some of the things that people said that were helpful to you? And what were some of the things that really didn't help and that you didn't appreciate? Oh, boy. Um, It's hard to remember those things now. Um, friends would say things that would, uh, that, that would be an encouragement. What were some of the things your friends did to, uh, to oh, help Oh, I remember you? being at um, a birthday party once and, and just talking about Stan. One of the things that, I, and I had to talk to my family about, because that first summer nobody talked about Stan. And I have a very close family, very supportive. Um, but at Thanksgiving, I just said, you know, I don't think we belong in this family anymore because, you know, you're all happy, you're all together. Even my parents had never experienced that kind of a loss. Um, and so they said, no, 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 you belong. And, and so I said, well, mm -hmm. we want to talk about Stan. Mm -hmm. And so allowing us to talk about Stan was one thing. Mm -hmm. I remember at this birthday party, this woman saying, I just had a memory and tears and that's okay, mm -hmm. it'll pass. And uh, she said, don't cry. And not probably the most unhelpful thing was just not being allowed to have the feelings that I had because you you don't get over grief you don't go around it you have to go through it and just being allowed to go through it because no one else can do that work for you you have to do it yourself mm -hmm. and to just have the support around going through it mm -hmm. there are of course many emotions after a loss I mean after all grief is an emotional response and Sometimes, you know, when we're feeling so helpless and the situation's out of control, we feel guilty and we feel anger. And I know you had some feelings around those issues. Can you, can you share a little bit about what you experienced and how you dealt with it? Well, I remember just weeks after Stan dying, I thought um, that I had caused the cancer. I thought, I thought we were happily married. I thought that, you know, all these things, but there must have been something that Stan was unhappy and caused stress and caused this cancer. And, and uh, I sort of went spiraling downward with guilt. And I realized, Bill, that that was my attempt to control, in an odd kind of way, mm -hmm. rewriting the script. Mm -hmm. If I could only go back mm -hmm. and change things mm -hmm. was a way of trying to take control. In the same way that right after he died, people would say, well, sell the house or do this. And I realized, no, nothing I do is going to bring Stan back. I just have to accept that helpless feeling mm -hmm. and I can't take control. But that's one of the hardest things we have to do, isn't it? I'm sure there are people watching and there's nothing we can do to change the situation. Believe it or not, you regain control faster. <laughs> And being a firstborn teacher type, I like to be in control. You regain it faster by, I, would, I had this phrase, sort of catchphrase, lean into the pain. 
and just lean into that sense of helplessness and pain and the way out is faster than trying desperately to cling on to it. Um, you talked about anger too. I realized, I, I remember telling Stan, because see, he, his wife had died before, and so we talked about that. And I said, you better not die on me. And he said, not, you know, he wouldn't. Um, and so I said, if you do, I'm gonna come out and stomp on your grave like I'll be. And so one, oh, it was about um, nine months after, it was a very blear, gloomy November day, and the kids and I went out to visit the grave, um, and I, I was so angry with him for leaving me with these children, young children to raise by myself. And I always felt he was the more adequate parent to start with. So um, I just stomped all over his grave. And the kids said, you do that, mommy. You told daddy you'd do it. And they said, well, we're not mad at daddy. And uh, I can't remember. We had this discussion about whether we were mad at daddy or God. Or, and, then I, and then I just fell down on the grave weeping. And I realized I just miss you so much. But the anger kept me connected to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that in letting go of my anger, I also had to let go of Stan. Mm -hmm. So were you angry at God? Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I like C.S. Lewis. Um, what shall I say, wise counsel that the question why is not so much a question as a cry of pain. And I think that, again, um, I look back now and I'm so grateful for the people around me who allowed me to express that anger because it wasn't really anger at God, it was just uh, my helplessness, uh, my pain, and allowing it to come out um, was a way of moving forward. So. And things hadn't worked out as you'd expected. Oh, absolutely, and not in my wildest, like I said, nightmares would I have thought that that's what would have been. Two children, Rachel and Johnny, were nine and four when Stan died. How did they react and what did you do to kind of help them through the loss of their dad? I think one of the things that we did was talk a lot about it. And uh, going back to that first Thanksgiving, I remember in, in my family at Thanksgiving, we all go around the table and from the youngest to the oldest say what we're thankful for. And my sister suggested that we go around the table and say what we missed about Stan and what we didn't miss about Stan. Because he didn't eat onions and she didn't miss that she had to make a whole separate dressing for Stan. And you know, it might sound, uh, uh, disrespectful but it was very refreshing because I think you can uh, sort of immortalize a person and to be free to say laugh about some of the things like he'd be so glad he wasn't here having to take pictures and um, but we talked a lot and and to this day do but the interesting thing Bill is I know that um, in the beginning I felt this compulsion to tell my story and the secretary at my son's school said that she's been a widow for 10 years and she knew that she was beyond it when that wasn't the first thing that you knew about her. And I thought mm -hmm. that's very interesting because I notice mm -hmm. myself now, I'm quite taken aback that there's people that, some people I don't, would never know that about me. Whereas at the beginning, I felt that that was all there was to know about me is that I'd lost my husband. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I found very helpful and people are different, um, was going to grief support groups. And the experience initially of, indeed that's how I met you, um, was to find, I thought, I can't, I will not survive this experience. It's not so much that um, I wanted to be dead, I just thought that life had stopped dead. 
and I didn't know how I could get going again. And, but I thought, there are people out there who've gone through this, and I have to find them. And indeed, when I found them, it, there was such a feeling of comfort, and I'm not a freak, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. And I wanted my children to have that same experience. Um, so that was very helpful for us. And actually, in a grief support group, I met the man that I'm going to marry now. So. Uh, not that I would, uh, that, when I went to that group, I, he remembers me sitting there saying, my life is over now. I have mm -hmm. to go on living to raise my children. Mm -hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, yeah. it's finished. Yeah. And he said, not today, not tomorrow, but there will be life again for you, yeah. Mary. And little did we ever dream yes. that he would be part of that. Right, so. Yes. so we're not saying go to grief groups to meet people, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that out of that common experience, in a sense, it's almost history repeating itself because you met Stan and encouraged him and helped him through the loss of his wife. And now uh, with Howard, You've, you've met someone who's been helping and encouraging you through your process and you through his. Yeah, um, I think to be understood is a very vital mm -hmm. thing and um, just for people to listen because you know what, you're the expert on your own grief and to have other people trying to be the expert is not helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you have, like even my family, I realized how close I am to them. None of them, not even my parents in their 80s have gone through this life experience. So it was meaningful for me to turn to other people who had shared the experience. And I always figure it's like a path through the Amazon jungle and we're all cutting our own swath through. But at least I can yell over to you and, and, and you'll say, yeah, Mary, like, you know, there's a big vine ahead, but you'll get through it in your own way, but to know mm -hmm. that other people yeah. are in that jungle with you. Yeah. So. What are some of the lessons of life that you've learned through this experience? Oh boy, I'd say finances is number one. I think Stan would really be getting a chuckle that I'm handling all the finances. Um, well, have, I mean, let's, let's just talk about that for a moment because it is a big adjustment, isn't it? I mean, some of these practical adjustments like doing the income taxes or paying the bills and stuff like that, it, it is a major adjustment that maybe people watching us are, are really finding oh, that that's where the rubber meets the Stan road. Stan was completely handy. I mean, he had a PhD in social work, but I, he could fix anything. As a matter of fact, one time Johnny found a dead bird and he said don't worry daddy will fix it <laughs> and I remember the first time I changed the light bulb on the front porch and the kids were cheering you know because I never did stuff like that but uh, it's been very exhilarating to learn how to do things. So you surprised yourself. Oh yeah. <laughs> and but you know what's interesting? <laughs> I remember when the summer that uh, we painted the swimming pool because I couldn't afford to have it painted by someone else and I thought Wow, Stan would be so surprised. Yeah, and I thought, yeah. no, Stan wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I'm surprised yes. that I'm doing this yeah, stuff. Yeah. So. so life is beginning to move on. Can you tell us a little bit, uh, maybe there's someone watching, and just a bit of encouragement for them uh, as they're watching and uh, perhaps struggling where you struggled a year or so ago? Well, I remember having this picture that I was like a little boat bobbing on the ocean and that to everyone around me it would not be perceptible but I was dragging an anchor and that throughout the rest of my life I'd be dragging this anchor but you know what in time you pull the anchor up and the boat sails on it still goes through storms um, but it's four years ago today actually we brought Stan home from the hospital and eight days later he died and um, you go through those storms but you do sail forward I always remember the summer holidays we spent with my granny and grandpa in a little town in Scotland. When I would say goodnight to my grandfather, he'd say, well, Bill, that's one day more 
and one day less. Not that he was a pessimist by any means. I think he'd really learned to come to terms with his own mortality. For it's only when we have an understanding of the fact that life is short that we really appreciate the wonder of life. How sad it is to see some people who, fearing that the end of life is near, try frantically to cram all the living that they can into the short time left to them. All the things they wanted to do, all the places they wanted to see, all the words that have been left unsaid, suddenly, or maybe finally, it dawns on them how precious is their time and how much more they really want to live it. The psalmist said, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. When we realize how short life is, then we're able to establish our priorities and decide what is really important. As someone said, oh, to reach the point of death and realize that we have never really lived. Perhaps the closer we come to understanding this, the more easily we come to accept death and learn how to live here and now.